to session two, everybody. <clears throat> a couple of minutes late, but things seem to be proceeding. Uh, <clears throat> the title is How to Survive Potential Assassination. It's got to do with debugging and apparently from the screen logging. And our speaker is Paul Waper. I need that. Great, thanks. Cool. So, welcome everyone. I'm Paul. I work at Red Hat and I work as a support maintenance engineer, which basically means I spend a lot of time reading other people's logs, uh, logs of programs, usually programs that have failed, and I'm trying to work out why so I can fix the customer website or the customer thing that's gone down. Um, now, in programming, what, one of the things that we've learned is that I, I think it's a known truism that um, one should always program as if the maintenance programmer that comes after you is a homicidal maniac that knows where you live. The problem is that this is also true of people who have to read your log files. So, good, and why are we not moving? Ah, we are moving, excellent. So, one approach of this is how to write good log files so maintenance engineers don't track you down, hide under your bed with a sharp knife and a fixed expression. The other way to look at it is how to make them happy so that they don't track you down, etc., etc., etc. So what makes us unhappy when we have to read log files? So here's some bad examples. Here's an example from the Linux kernel. Um, there's a couple of th things that the kernel does right, things like facilities so that you can, and the machine name, so that you can combine multiple log files from different machines and you can see which things happened on which machines at which times. The problem here that I have is firstly we have no time zone, so these days in, with distributed machines across the globe, if you're trying to work out what a server in Cincinnati did for a customer who's in New York, and you don't even know whether those are the same time zone, or what, when they say something went wrong at 6 p.m., um, you, don't, you have no idea of working out whether 6 p.m. in the log file is the same thing that 6 p.m. they're talking about. It also doesn't have the year. So reading through historic log files, which sometimes we have to do, starts to get annoying, and especially when you're <coughs> combining different log files from different machines across different years and so forth. But really, the real problem here is it's not even sortable. June comes after August. You can, yes, you can use sort dash whatever it is to read the, hu the human month, but no one remembers that. Um, you're much better having a date there that is, that is easy to sort feed straight through the sort filter, and away you go. So, here's another example from the Linux kernel. This is, I, I love it, errors like this, because it always brings out the sarcastic person in me. What's going to happen next? Does the card blow up? Does it dis un unmount itself? Does it decide to work anyway? We have no idea. I know that for some, in some instances with hardware, it's really difficult to know what the hardware is actually doing. But telling us what's going to happen next here, why, what am I going to do with this unrecoverable error in the card, that's a really good um, way for someone reading that log to say, therefore, I don't have to worry about this, or therefore, that's why you have an error, that's why you have network loss, because the card just decided to reboot itself and it's going to, or it's dropped off the network and never, never to be seen again. So here's an example from the Linux kernel. I'm, I'm not picking on the Linux kernel, it just happens to have a bunch of the errors that I find particularly annoying. Um, this is one from my own laptop when you put in a micro SD card and try copying things from it, it says DMA error. Okay, good. And it said card added. Did I lose the last one? What, what, what happened? Do I now have two cards? Do I now have multiple devices? But really, the other point, problem with this is that you get multiple of these and 
because they're two lines rather than one, the kernel's usual method of rate control doesn't work, so you get heaps of them even in your log file. Megabytes, that's, that's a bit annoying when you have to ask a customer who can be on a thin piece of string to send you down 500 gigabytes of log files. Okay, so here's a slightly different example from the Linux kernel. Um, I, back in the day when we had IBM main, mainframes and space was measured in kilobytes, we, could, we, we had tables that said what one meant there. But these days we have lots of space, so we should be able to enumerate at least, if I've read one from that, what it why, why it's one and not something else, it, say it's an exit code one. And secondly, what am I going to do now that I've alerted, that, that I've uh, aborted ab abnormally? Does log rotate stop working? Does it keep on working? Who knows? Okay, so it's just for a change, here's a, uh, an example from Samba. There's, Samba does a bunch of things that I like, like having the file name, uh, or the source code name, and the line number, and the function that I was in when I printed this log line. Does anyone, can it, does anyone read Samba logs? Does anyone know what the problem with this is? Those are on two separate lines. So grep is useless. You start grepping for a time, and you lose the log, the actual message that was related to that, you start look, grepping for the log message and suddenly you have no time context. And that's nice, you can create a regular expression that goes through and grabs every second line, oh, but we have six lines, or arbitrarily num large numbers of lines. So that's another um, pain to try and read through. Here's an example from Apache. Now, there's Apache does give you a fair bit of um, information, and I like that. But why do they have two times... Uh, why do, firstly, why does the IP matter more than the time it came from? When in the error log, I get the time first. In the uh, access log, I get the time second. If I sort the access log, I get it sorted by IP address, which is rarely what you want. And we're still when we're inconsistent with that format of the time. Some, sometimes it's sat 10, oct 10, sometimes it's 10, oct 2015. I don't really care which day of the week it was. It's still inconsistent and it's still not sortable. This is, uh, my final example here is a uh, slightly different context. This is from the Postgres error logs. This is the usual format that you get Postgres error logs. Uh, anyone doing, say, less star on them or grep star on them finds out that Friday is uh, actually after Monday. Which is, and, oh, and by the way, if the day, if you happen to read this on a Saturday, then the Saturday will be earlier than the Sunday, sorry, the Saturday will be later than the Sunday because, the, because it revolves around day of week. So again, a, a consist, getting a cons consistent um, format there, and again, I don't really care whether it happened on a Friday or a Monday, I care what date it was. That's usually what I'm searching for. There's a couple of other things that I, wanted, I think is, are worth mentioning that I can't find good examples of, mainly because the programs I, do, I read don't do this. One is having, and I know everyone kind of in, ends up being a bit guilty of this, in uh, having, when we're doing debugging, we say, ah, oh, exit one, or arg died here. And we just copy and paste that throughout the code because we have to die a number of times for you sort of the same reason. And then someone comes along, it's like the unrecoverable unre error in card. If that happens exactly once in the code, then at least you can search through the code, find the, the error message and say, okay, now I know where it came from. If that happens a dozen times in the code, then now you don't know where it came from and it's even less useful. Um, then the other thing that's easy to do when we're doing maintenance and especially when we're debugging is 
coming along and say, okay, I've fixed the bug there, I'll, t I'll just delete all the log lines because they clutter up my code. Please, please keep them in, keep, the, keep them there and make them informational messages that I can turn on later because chances are you will come back to that code and refactor it or you'll write a new piece of code and you want to know what's going on in there and suddenly you need those log lines again. The other one that I find uh, particularly arises my, arises my desire for satire is ambiguous messages, things that tell me that there's something wrong except that there isn't. Now you can get this message from Bash. So was it an error? Or did it, did it work or fail? Did I, am I in the new directory or not? I don't know. You get this error, I found out, if for some reason you close standard error while in Bash. Bash checks that it can write to standard error each time it wants to write a command, finds out it can't, tells you the right error, and then does the command anyway, and oh, good news, there was a success. So that's amusing. So to look at why we're, to, to look at what makes good logging, I think you need to ask why are we logging in the first place? And the number one reason, strangely enough, is actually just to record program state. The kernel doesn't tell you that it's booting up because it thinks there's a problem with that. But you may be interested to see that the kernel is booting every 10 minutes. You also need to know what version of the kernel it is or what version of the program it is. Um, you need, it's nice to see in Apache when someone requests a page. That's not an error. That's okay. It's just a piece of state. The second reason, which is kind of related to that, is you want to give the, your users information that they can use to fix their problem, even though that's not a problem with your code. If you're getting a lot of 404s on your website, that's not because the code is wrong. That's because someone's requesting a whole bun a bunch of admin pages that you've thoughtfully not included. So again, when you're including that, that, that information, asking yourself, what, what am I telling, can I tell the user how to fix the problem at this point is going to make a really good log line, really something that, that is useful for them. And thirdly, we write obviously log lines because we want to fix a problem in the code. And that, again, you need in the information about what's going on there. Um, and it is sometimes tempting to put in, I died, or you stupid user, or something like that. But informative messages are going to give you, uh, make it easier for you to debug that problem, move on, and fix, fix the error, and uh, keep everyone happy. So, in that case, we can say, now we know why we're logging, what are we actually going to write? Obviously, the first thing I want is timestamp. Include the year, month, and day, so you can sort it. Include the milliseconds, because when you're reading a whole bunch of, when a whole bunch of things are happening at once, um, and you're often, say, reading access log, error log, it's useful to be able to interleave those together and see this thing happened after that thing, rather all of the things in this second happened before all of the things in the next. And printing out milliseconds is usually not a problem. You want to record the location in the code that you came from. This is useful for debugging, obviously, but it's useful for me as a maintenance engineer because I can go and read the code for something like, I can say, okay, well, I hit an unrecoverable error here, and then I can work backwards. I know that you know, these variables has, had this state here, therefore I can fix it. Now comes the really hard one, logging why you're, why you're logging. The, the, the reason that's hard is because it's really hard to give you a definitive statement of what you need to put there. But I think of this as the kind of, um, why are you telling me this? Don't tell me you know, an error occurred. 
tell me what error occurred. Tell me why, tell me why I care about that. What can I do about it? That also makes us, to, to, sorry, to backtrack slightly, we deal with, I deal with verbosity levels later, but in, if you include that verbosity level, I can get an impression, if, it's, if that's you know, level one, then that's a really important error that I need to deal with, even if it says something like, you know, null pointer occurred. If that's an error, error level five or nine, I know that's a pure piece of information, and it, we probably expected a null there, and that's okay. We can also record all the relevant information, including the logic that led us to that decision. So if we're um, saying, we're, we're checking whether we've strolled off the end of an array, we say, okay, our array length is 10, and we're now position 11, and that's bad. Rather than just say, fell off the end of the array, because I don't know why or what, and I can't do much about it, if you can at least tell me which array or how long that was, then I can, then I can probably find out further and fix it. Okay. And obviously, because this is my passion, logging more information rather than keeping it for, I know as a programmer, you really, I really hate it when I have to go, okay, I'm gonna write a log line after every major decision that I put in this code. But that's really useful. And if I can tell, if I can tell the user what error code one meant or why I got it, rather than just say, I give up, that's a really useful thing. And it helps you as a, a programmer as well, because if you have to explain why that's there or what information you had, then you're, you're more likely to go, hmm, you know, I could probably deal with that. So, sorry, the two things that I don't think count, who loves reading back um, stack backtraces? <laughs> okay, there is one person, good. I'm gonna to try to convince you that this is a bad thing. The two problems that I have with stack backtraces uh, firstly, they, give, they usually give you no information as to state of variables. You'll, you'll find out that you entered a function, but you have no idea why. Um, the second reason is because you will usually get 40 lines of, or 40, you know, 80 lines with 40 calls of your model view controller hierarchy and your library for loading, uh, extra modules and so forth, and the only thing you care about is those one or two lines right at the end that say, I got a string when I was expecting an integer. That's, that's the bit, if you can, instead of throwing a, an error there, if you can actually, if you, instead of just throwing type error, if you can tell me what you got and why you thought it was going to be an integer and so forth, then I can probably deal with it. And in that case, you can probably write an error rather than a backtrace. The second reason, the second thing that I want to convince you not to do is use asserts as debugging. Now, asserts are good in code because they are that last resort for your logic to say, okay, I have exited my, you know, I've hit a null here. I really, really can't continue at this point. I'm trying to traverse a linked list and I really shouldn't get a null there, that sort of thing. So you, you do want those assert statements there. The, but the problem with them is, again, uh, the usual format of an assert is assert condition, comma, string. And people write, okay, condition, pointer not null, or pointer equals null, or pointer not null, and then the string, what will I put there? Oh pointer not null. People get bored at that point, so you don't give me any more information. So if your assert statement's going to die, then the, the I can't tell at that point why it died, because it's easy just not to tell you. Secondly, assert statements will often get compiled out when you're, so you'll write the, you have the um, testing version, which 
turns on all the assert statements and runs really slowly because of that. And uh, then you say, okay, we've done, we've done all of our unit tests so we know the code is absolutely 100% correct. And therefore, uh, we can turn all of the assert statements off and now we're going to ship it in production. And I read that log file and I go, hmm, I get no information. I wonder where he lives. Anyway. So to, just talking about verbosity levels, which, we, which I mentioned earlier, um, there's a couple of different approaches here in sort of in order of increasing complexity. I'm going to try to convince you that the last one here is the most important, but it's difficult to do. The, the obvious one is the sort of fatal errors, error levels, warnings, information, and debugging. So you turn on, you know, dash dash, error if you want to see all the errors in the code, or you print a standard error if there's an error, if you print a standard output if there's a warning, that sort of thing. Um, the, the sort of expansion on that is the verbosity level of zero to nine. So zero meaning keep absolutely quiet, nine meaning give me everything. Um, the, there's an orthogonal idea to that, which is to say, Give me all of the information about a particular activity. Uh, anyone use Myth TV here, by the way? Yes, good, good. So Myth TV options have the 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 the, the um, logging, the, the debugging information. You say verbosity equals all, or verbosity equals database, or verbosity equals video, you, and you just find the error message or the the information relating to working on that particular feature in your code. So, and that I think is actually makes a lot of sense. A lot of people try to use um, bit masks to do this. Uh, and bit, bit masks are the correct way to implement activities, but they're not the correct way to implement verbosity. Why? Because one is always greater than zero and two is always greater than one. You don't bit mask that, you just say, am I greater than the current verbosity level? Whereas you can use a bit mask effectively to say this particular debugging information is relating to allocating memory or opening files or working with the network. And then you can go a bit more sophisticated on that and that can have a combination of those two. So I say I want verbosity level three, okay, um, but I want that just in the network. Or in re the, the really sophisticated one is I want to be able to set network debugging at level five and for file system debugging at level one and memory debugging at level zero. That takes more work, but it's doable and I think for a lot of programs it'd actually give you really good information because the problem is for a maintenance programmer, people, we will, a customer will say, Here's the information, and I'll go, ah, oh, that's nowhere near enough information. So the, the sensible option is not to choose just enough, because I don't know what is, what is enough. Is, it does three give me the right information that two verbosity won't? I don't know. I'd have to read the code. That'd be annoying. Um, so then going to, um, so I just say, turn on verbosity nine and fill up your hard disk with logs. And then when that crashes, send them to me. Okay, so quickly covering how to write log files. Um, obviously you want, well maybe not obviously, but I think you should have one standard function that includes, that, that is used everywhere to write log files. It includes the debug uh, level that you're currently writing from and a printf style or a, a, a list of things to print out and it just does a simple test and um, then print. You should be able to write to a file or a handle like standard out or standard error. You should aim to st store in files a usual default file, uh, if not elsewhere. Um, and daemons running should at least be using the standard facilities of syslog just to, t to say I have started up here and I'm going to die now. Um, 
you want to standardize the conventions in your log, log file. So as an example, I sort of made, I don't know, that comes later. Um, so you, if you're going to prevent, present, I think I have it now. <laughs> so this, that, that's easy to read because a lot of it is columnar. Uh, it's easy to see where the, um, the information is. It's all kind of in the same context. Um, and because it's delimited with spaces, I can just use cut or orc uh, or sed to find things. Um, you can you have things like file comma so file colon line in bracket function that seems to be a standardised convention, and things like IP address colon port. Um, again, it makes searching for colon eighty really easy. And log consistency, yeah. Yes. I like sortable dates. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And I'll co cover a really useful utility that if, hopefully I'll get time. Um, so logging consistently, the same things in the same places. It's nice. I, I would love to see people log when they enter a function and when they exit it uh, and why. Um, the major decisions such as I tried to do a database connection here, but it failed. Um, and the calls to other things that aren't going to produce log lines as well, uh, especially if they are things like, say, databases or other libraries that are going to do a large chunk, and the return codes from them as well, so you know what happened. OK, a last bit about controlling um, logging, oh, two bits ago, controlling logging Firstly, obviously, you want to control that from a program option. Usually, if you're writing a command line program, dash V. I, people use dash D, but I think verbosity is better than debugging because it's nice to believe that you don't have any bugs. Um, and dash V, 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 V for more verbosity. Um, or dash debug the activity type or the more sophisticated activity equals one, activity equals three, and so forth. Um, the same, you should be able to do the same things in your configuration file. So you can, should be able to say verbosity uh, is equals zero to nine, or networking verbosity equals zero to nine. Good. And be able to set where the log file goes as well in the configuration file. Now, how how does a user actually say now I want to? I'm running the program now, I'm running Apache, I want to turn on debugging, but I don't want to stop it so that it stops re accepting requests, because I'm actually trying to run a, run a web server that re accepts requests. Um, one way is to use signals, use signal, people, some people use signal one, user one to tell the code to turn on debugging, user two to, to turn it off. That's in no way documented, so please don't do that. Instead, I would suggest using IPC or signal um, or network sockets, something like system control or program control, debugging on, uh, or reload your config, or just debugging on, um, or verbosity level five. That way, your daemon doesn't have to restart, and you're going to see more logging. And then you can turn it off in the same command. Okay, log files very briefly, um, because we've kind of touched on that. Logging to standard file by default, or foreground, if you're running in foreground and daemon, log to sta write to standard error or standard out. Um, and log rotation is the last thing. I would, again, I would suggest keeping more, li lo more logs rather than less. So either do your own log rotation and keep the file open, write to it, and remember to flush so that people using tail-f will see it as well, um, and then close it when you finish with that file and rotate over to the new file, or understand log rotate and just do open, append, close. You don't need to, fire, you don't need to um, uh, 
worry about the log rotation because log rotate will do that and you don't need to flush because close will do that. And obviously writing, keep as, keep as much as you can and if you're using log rotate, that will usually give you some kind of compression so you don't end up filling all your disk space. Okay, I hope I've still got time for a quick plug. I've been using a program, program called LNAV, which is a log file navigator, and it is absolutely fantastic. It will read all the files. If you give it a directory, it will read all those, the files in that directory, even ones that are gzip and bzip2 compressed, expand them in memory, sort them by timestamp, and give you them in time order. It also does syntax highlighting, so you can see IP addresses. The same IP address will have the same color throughout. You can see where the same connections are done. The same process ID and kernel messages will come, have the same color. Why are we reading logs in black and white and source code in color? We should be reading every you know, log lines the same. You can do real-time Perl-compatible regular expression searching in your log file, so you see as you're typing, whether your search is matching. Uh, you can see a histogram over time of where the log, file, log lines occur. So, ooh, this, this bit here is really, really busy, and this bit is quiet, and here's where we've got a lot of error messages, and then go to that time. You can move forward by, or backward by hour or by day. So if you want to see the same time, over, same period in the day over time, you can do that. And this feature, I'm still getting my head around, but it works fantastically. You can treat your log files uh, with the fields in them as fields to search in an SQL database with standard SQL queries. So you can say, select star from log where source IP address equals blah. And that, or select count from star. You can do group buys and things like that. It's really incredibly handy. It is a very, very powerful program. And all command line, text-based, very, very simple, not, you know, low memory overhead. So get it from lnav.org. And with that, I think, any are there any questions? Hmm. Blinded them with talking too much. <laughs> OK, well, hopefully you will continue to live unmolested by uh, maintenance programmers and by people reading your logs. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Paul. I don't know whether you did too much talking, but it seemed to make a lot of sense to people, but I don't know how the audience uh, received it, since they didn't ask any questions. You got a question? Sorry. <laughs> so the question is, should, it, should they be scared of me? I try not to kill people. Um, that, the whole, that, that's mainly for comic effect, as you probably know, but um, it really matters to a lot of people, uh, you know, thinking of not just when you're, when you're programming, think, thinking of the people that are going to be using your code, thinking of the people that are going to be writing, to, to, sorry, reading your log files to try and determine what went wrong. Uh, that, to me, has been a really powerful motivator in how, what, what information I put out. So, yeah, cool. Any other comments or questions? Yes, we have one. Uh, what do you think of the quality of LNAV's logging? <laughs> it is variable. It's, and LNAV is not a general purpose tool for reading files. It's very specifically for time-sequenced log files. Um, it, it also uh, tries to act locally, so it, it will remember where you were in a particular directory. If, you're, if you sort of run the same command again, it will remember that session. But if you run it on a new directory, you will get a, a new session, and it, it doesn't... Um, import any of the same ideas from a separate location. Its handling of when things go slightly wrong uh, is a bit annoying, but it's, and again, it's, it's made for a 
run it on debug mode, copy the entire chunk of information that comes out to it, post it to the Google group, uh, and then the author can have a read of it. <laughs> so it's, as a debugging, as a logging method, that's, that leaves a bit to be desired. No further questions? Okay, well, thanks very much, Paul. Thank you. I learned a bit that I'll probably never use, but <laughs> <laughs> since I don't cool. write code. Nice. Uh, but that was nice news. We're glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks. And I love woodwork.